Hi, Alexi. Hi, how are you? Good, good. Uh, thanks for joining us again. You were talking with us on Blogging Heads a few uh, weeks ago. Let me introduce us um, before we get started talking about some recent pretty dramatic events in Russia. Um, you are Alexei Sidorenko. You are managing editor of uh, Runet Echo, I gather, um, uh, whose mission is to uh, interpret the uh, Russian Internet. Is, do I have that right? Yeah, yeah. That's and great. And uh, in addition to that uh, credential, you were uh, born, raised, and educated in Moscow, although you're in uh, Warsaw at the moment. Um, anyway, something uh, apparently Internet-related happened over the weekend in Russia that was, uh, some people are saying, may, may be transformational, um, which is that uh, for the first time, tens of thousands of Russians demonstrated uh, and said very unflattering things about uh uh, Vladimir Putin and uh, and were allowed to say them. Um, it, it was it was by far the largest uh, hostile demonstration he had faced, and maybe one of the biggest demonstrations, or maybe the biggest since Russia gained its independence from the Soviet Union. Um, now, you, your 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 job is to interpret uh, kind of Russian politics in the context of uh, new media like 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 the internet, which certainly seemed to be implicated in in this. Uh, do you think this is as big a deal as other people are saying? Yes, I believe it's a big deal. And um, I think it's a really uh, paradigm sh shift in uh, the way Russians perceive politics and the way they engage in it. However, I would say that although the demonstrations were massive, it's the, I mean, the battle is won, but the war is not. So mm -hmm. uh, the uh, citizens' <clears throat> ability to actually influence the politics uh, is still very low. So uh, this one-time manifestation, although it was countrywide, it was in many, many locations around Russia and around the world, uh, it has manifested a certain will for renegotiation of the uh, social contract, but it actually did not uh, renegotiate it. So this is why I would say that there is a long road ahead of uh, those people I call broader politicians, which I believe they became um, politicians already. I mean about those people who were either pushed online from the offline political sphere, from mm -hmm. the mainstream po politics that became very narrow, or th they were born online in the political sense. I mean, they, they appeared as political entities uh, in the online sphere because the offline political uh, mainstream was already closed for them. So I think that uh, into, uh, in sat on Saturday, they actually had reclaimed at least part of their offline so, political space. So this was was kind of the first, you know, big real-world manifestation of something that had been bubbling in the virtual world, in the online world, uh, yeah. among people who felt marginalized by the government's essential control of mainstream media, like big newspapers, TV stations, right? Those were pretty firmly in government control. There had been this kind of conversation you were part of uh, on, the, on the margins, um, and finally these people got together and, and, and mobilized. Yes, yes. I, I, I believe something like this happened, and um, I think that's uh, really interesting how they actually managed to make it a massive, be without any violence, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm about to write an article how they managed to do this, because it was not a, an easy thing to do. Well, I can remember, like, on Friday, on Thursday, there were screams on Twitter and Facebook, like, hey, people, just please help me to convince people to come at this particular place and to be nonviolent and to demand just to rerun the elections and not a revolution like Taqir style. Uh, it, uh, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, uh, the, because there were two alternatives, mm -hmm. and the, uh, these two alternatives, 
it was not decided by the, uh, let's say, like the online majority of people, of those bloggers who are critical to the government, but still they consider themselves uh, uh, responsible citizens. Um, so it, it was a big discussion there. And it was not, uh, it could uh, work out in a completely different way as it did on Saturday. Okay. Now, you mentioned Tahrir Square. Do you think this is, at some fundamental level, the same thing that's, that has been going on with the Arab Spring and maybe with Occupy Wall Street and other things, which is just that technology allows uh, people who otherwise might not be able to reach critical mass for one reason or another, including in, in some cases, uh, you know, a government control of media. Um, it allows them to reach that critical mass. It, 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 do you, you see this as, as, as kind of one and the same with the Arab Spring at some level? I, I would rather uh, compare it to the Occupy movement or hmm. the uh, number of European movements in summer. Uh, I would say it's rather, uh, it, it's more like this because um, wh when we speak of, of, of uh, Takrir, I, I guess it's um, the, the Takrir style event would happen if the government will not do anything uh, and it will uh, stay the same for, and like the Takrir style event might happen in like uh, three or four years if no changes are implemented then it will be Takrir. So far it's Occupy Movement, a light version I would say. But what I, what I mean is in, in both cases is it something that probably wouldn't have happened if it weren't for the internet? Uh, yeah, I mean, without the internet, something like this would be very unlikely. Mm -hmm. um, okay, now, an interesting thing happened uh, in terms of the reaction to this by the, the Russian political establishment, uh, which is, first of all, that uh, the, the, the uh, uh, Putin did not did not condemn it. They did not try to, to stop it or suppress it. Okay, and uh, and then the um, and they did not dismiss it. His party did not dismiss it entirely. And um, uh, secondly, the mainstream TV, which is essentially, as I said, under government control, um, chose to report it straight. Right. I mean, they more or less showed people throughout Russia what was actually going on. Right. Well, I would say, uh, except a thing that they did not mention any anti-government uh, slogans. Oh, and they didn't? Uh, no, they didn't. For example, there were a lot of slogans like Putin uh, go away or Medvedev go away and uh, uh, really some nasty things. They didn't mention it. They, uh, like some, uh, some media uh, even said that it was because people were disappointed with uh, reforms in communal systems. So, uh, but uh, actually, yes, I mean, the overall reaction towards NTV uh, and the first channel, uh, the, uh, uh, the most controlled uh, uh, TV channels, uh, was rather uh, surprising for many. People were like, wow, is that television again or uh, well, the same we saw? But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it was uh, kind of an uh, interesting uh, reaction and probably it, it can be put into this Putin's logic that you do not uh, kind of uh, stick your enemy to, to the corner, uh, like no. put into the corner because then it, the fight might get nasty. So everyone is now sus uh, uh, is suspicious that what will be the next uh, uh, yeah. Turn so it, it, because it was probably a, uh, a right uh, thing to do, whatever case. But you know, everyone like, well, it's it's not that easy. You know, like it, it, there there is a catch somewhere. Okay, let me so let me be clear that the TV did the mainstream TV convey that you know one of the main uh, grievances of the demonstrators, which is that they think the recent elections were not. Fair that they were that they were kind of rigged a little, and that they should have the elections again, uh, yeah, or, or, yeah. Some, or, or it should at least be investigated. That was conveyed on television, on mainstream yes. television. Okay, yes. which is kind of important. I, I um and and and, uh, and is it okay? So you said partly this is a reflection of Putin's tactical nature, which is don't confront his enemies in a way that could backfire on you. 
Is it also a kind of acknowledgement of the power of the Internet? In other words, they realize this isn't going away and they can't live in denial of it? Is, is it a watershed in that sense? I don't think it's about the Internet. It's rather about the society because, uh, they, they, like, the Putin and his surroundings rather would think that, uh, okay, people are angry, so we shouldn't make them more angry. And mm -hmm. there is no much debate about the Internet or things like that. They simply miss out this. They see some kind of discontent, and they are trying to uh, to deal with it. And uh, there is, of course, the, the, there are certain, like not certain, like a lot of tactics to uh, discourage people from communicating. It's from DDoS attack to hashtag spamming, a lot of, uh, and to uh, certain jam uh, cell phone jamming, for example, on Triumphalne on December 6, uh, because there was also a big, m uh, a big. Um, manifestation of course not that big as it was on Saturday uh, yeah so uh, I would say it's it's actually it, it, they, they regard the current events in the traditional paradigm which it might be a, a, a certain risk for uh, Putin himself that mm -hmm. he do, do, does not appreciate the uh, power of the internet so so he what is your prediction about what's going to happen? What, what is the next? I mean, the demonstrations seem to have subsided, at least for now. I mean, of course, the weekend is over, and, and weekend is prime time for demonstrations, I guess. But um, what do you think is going to happen next? Well, I think what is going to happen next is that uh, Putin will try to win time, to win time until the New Year's Eve, and the... Uh, because we have a vacation about for 10 days afterwards. So uh, he will probably, because the next protest action is scheduled on December 24th, so the idea is to win time to make people be occupied with their like home problems, uh, buying presents and choosing which country to travel on a vacation. And mm -hmm. after that, there will be simply no time for the opposition to prepare for uh, for the presidential elections, except they would also organize campaign vote against uh, vote for anyone except Vladimir Putin. But the point is that what they are not able to do right now already is that to present their own candidate, which might be a game changer because uh, at this part uh, uh, of uh, at this uh, part of, like of the game as I see it. Uh, for example, if uh, persons like Navalny or Yashin were released from jail and would start a campaign right now, uh, like a presidential campaign, they would be able to bypass even those very high limitations for running for a president. Uh, there, they exist, uh, like in Russia now, for example, like 100,000 signatures to collect. I mean, with, with the scale of the events right now, if the, if the momentum is not lost, it would really turn into a second independent candidate in March. Okay, but so I, this is... Oh, sorry, go ahead. But I think that uh, already, because uh, Navalny, for example, is detained, uh, he has no time to, to do this, simply for bureaucratic reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think that, that there are two, uh, two scenarios. One of them is a kind of a... A uh, negative one uh, for the civil society is that exactly Putin uh, and Kremlin gets what they want to, they win time, and then uh, it goes uh, in a very, uh, very moment that uh, it goes in the way that, okay, everyone is happy what happened on Saturday, but that's it, and they don't want to do anything else because they feel satisfied that they went on the streets once in a lifetime mm -hmm. and they feel their citizen duty is uh, fulfilled, and Kremlin does what, what it did for all these years before. Um, yeah, so, so th there is no big change. Or okay. there yeah. is a more active and yet less... Um, 
uh, less predictable scenario when uh, the uh, the uh, bloggers are keeping the momentum, they are trying to collect the, uh, the signatures, or the uh, actually uh, well, let's say hijack or like not hijack but uh, turn into partnership with the, one of the one of the three uh, parties that are left that can propose candidates, uh, and then they are on a base of one such party they are running for a, pres a presidential campaign and then it can be really interesting and I think that still even if uh, there is a second independent candidate uh, uh, there is a still a uh, high possibility of Putin winning because okay. I mean, unlike a United Russia, his personal support is pretty much high. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's 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 review some of this. So, United Russia is the party he is part of, and and, and you're saying his personal support. He, he, his he's personal. Not, he's he, not a member of United Russia. Oh, he's That's not. The funny thing. Technically, he's not, and yet his fate is tied in with it, right? It, it's a majority in parliament that United Russia holds that is part of his power base somehow, right? Well, yes, but the point is that it's, uh, it, in, in a certain sense, it's his, uh, let's say, uh, it's a pocket party. I mean, uh, it's based on a number of uh, assumptions uh, and, and, and a, a number of uh, certain power lines among them power lines, I mean, the power of the uh, FSB and so on, the Federal Security Service. So, for example, if Putin will decide that he would uh, he would drop the United Russia and would like to create a uh, united, uh, like this um, People's Front that he has already, so because of the United Russia has a bad image, uh, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of politicians from the United Russia will simultaneously, uh, as soon as Putin spells it out, they would uh, change sides and they would simply rebrand re themselves from United Russia politicians okay. to People's Front politicians. Okay, so let, can we can we review a little the, the politics of this uh, for for people who haven't been uh, paying attention? Part of this we covered in our last conversation, but you were saying. Um, the uh, the way the government maintains control, there, there are at least two major prongs here. One is control of the mainstream media. The other is that um, in order to, to, to be in parliament, you have to be part of a, a, a party, and the government controls, you know, the, the prerequisites for party formation. The government, the government uh, has a way of keeping people it doesn't like from, from having the, the, you know, uh, the platform of a party to use. And one thing I think you're suggesting here is that this whole new thing we're seeing, part of which is technically based in the internet and blogging and so on, um, it, it, it is not only useful when it comes to mobilizing people on the street, it's also potentially useful, and this is the big question, I think, it's potentially useful um, for overcoming those obstacles to getting a, a candidate into parlor, overcoming the, the obstacles for party formation and so on, right? And it sounds like you're saying that is the big question. Are they going to use this platform uh, not only to get people out on the street, but, but also to start organizing politically? And it's interesting because this is very much the question that confronts the Occupy Wall Street movement, you know, but are they going to go into phase two and start um, you, organizing Politically, that, that that is kind of the big a big question, right? Yeah, and I mean that's a really uh, good question because they have all the capacity they need. I mean, I was counting uh, the possible uh, outcomes uh, at the Saturday protests. I spent like four hours on just simply adding uh, numbers of people, how many would go to these uh, Saturday protests. And uh, 67,000 all around Russia would say they would go, and uh, 63,000 more they said they would probably go, which already gives us enough people for uh, a lot of things. I mean, if all of them are real and, and all of them are come out, I mean, like 120,000 of active citizens are able to uh, overcome any uh, law that already exists. And it was a problem before because, for example, with Parnas, and they relied on offline techniques only, 
uh, the they were what they were a, a political for, party or what? what you, yeah, they, they are. They were trying to register a political party, mm -hmm. and they got forty-four thousand signatures, and uh, uh, it, some of them were claimed to be. Oh right, and uh, like like forty were fraudulent, so they threw the whole thing. The government threw all forty-four thousand out because some small number were claimed fraudulent. Yeah, right? but the point is uh, that compared to the. Uh, Current situation, and especially that it is, uh, it can be done in an absolutely transparent way. Uh, and if the Central Electoral Commission doesn't accept these signatures, then there will be another protest event, and those right. groups of collecting signatures will simultaneously turn into protest groups. Then it leads right. to another political crisis. And, right. Uh, yeah. So you. And, and, you and but the. the that reminds me of Egypt a little, where you have this rhythm, the people gather and the government says, okay, we're going to do this, and in that case, even the leader leaves, and then after a while, the, the people say, no, 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 this isn't good enough, and they start demonstrating again, and, yeah. and you have to have kind of both, both of these, uh, these, you know, there may be a, pen, a rhythm between these two phases, but go ahead. Yeah, and uh, this is the way they can actually become a political power independent and yet playing even those unfair rules that are uh, uh, in the country right mm -hmm. now. So, so the, the, this is actually interesting, but uh, I believe that, <laughs> uh, that there is a big probability that uh, people will not have a vision uh, to do that. Yeah, I, yeah at least you know, we will see. You know, it's just there is a probability that uh, in many uh, cases uh, Russians made a, not the kind of the most, uh, I would say, citizen aware uh, well, decisions. And, and here, I mean, I wonder if, if, if uh, in that context we're not seeing, you know, uh, the other side of the coin of this uh, new powerful technology, which is that, you know, because it is easier now to mobilize thanks to this technology, that means that you can get what looks like a, an impressive uh, display of, of uh, political sentiment out on the street. And, and, you know, what seems like a fairly large number of people by historical standards, which doesn't necessarily represent a very large part of the actual population, right? Because, because these organizing technologies are so efficient, um, you know, you, 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 you can get a, a, a fairly small group of people can, can get a fairly high percentage of its members out there, uh, and, and, and they just may not be representative of the population at, at large. Is that a, a, a possibility here? Well, this is the very common argument Putin makes and his uh, supporters that, uh -huh. oh, you know, you see, like, people gathered on the Internet, well, like, you know, they're like just some strange... Uh, geeks, uh, whatever, protesters and radicals, and they just don't want to play the rules, and that's it. But I think that it's uh, quite different. It actually, you know, the there is this 99-1 uh, rule that, you know, like there are 90 readers, 9 commenters, and 1% of writers. So <laughs> I think that we, we actually are facing something like this that those people who manifested actually went out on the streets, they represent uh, those uh, much more massive, like uh, there is an uh, e economist called Konstantin Sonin, and he says that actually those who are protesting now, who were protesting on Saturday, they are supported by, he calls them, silent millions. Mm -hmm. And uh, those people who do not know how to write the blogs, who do not want necessarily to engage into active politics, but who are unhappy, and uh, who actually voted against United Russia. Because aside from the uh, fact that um, the elections were rigged, we should not uh, uh, forget that it was 14 percent or 13 percent less than on the previous elections. Right. Even yeah, in, other so, words, in other words, United Russia did much more poorly, and, oh, and, yeah. and now I, I think holds something like, by the new elections, the recent elections will hold something like 49% of parliament. So its support did drop uh, considerably 
um, notwithstanding the claims that there was some rigging of the elections on on their part. Um, oh yeah, I mean, and if there would be no rigging, you know, what 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 will be the real uh, uh, the real outcome for the United mm -hmm. Russia then? So that's and, uh, and, and by rigging, you mean uh, the things I read about were people like you know bosses encouraging their workers to vote or paying them to vote for United Russia or something was there also there are also allegations of the ballot box stuffing and so on is oh it, yeah you think you think, you think <laughs> there mean, was a lot I mean uh, in Russian standards even like uh, people are okay uh, might be okay with bosses pushing their employees to vote for a certain party it, it kind of be, might be accepted it, it's not a fair play but you know like people understand that sometimes people just choose economy but the point is that people mostly protest about ballot stuffing and not just about ballot stuffing but simply uh, people uh, who, who rigged elections would put different numbers into the uh, electronic system, the Gus Weber, mm -hmm. uh, which was different from the paper results, mm -hmm. and, and there are, uh, and for, or for example, completely rude numbers, uh, like f out of their fantasy, not of the real outcome, and uh, such cases are documented, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there is a video and and um, accounts of. Uh, personal uh, like personal accounts on this and there are huge events like not to mention like obviously very suspicious outcomes in Chechnya for example with 99.57 uh, uh, percent uh, for United Russia that seems a little suspicious yes I mean, I, I, I was an, uh, I studied electoral geography at the university for three years and in no democratic country I mean you wouldn't even like if there is a like strange situation you wouldn't have more than 85 or 90 percent I mean like it's really impossible mm. okay so so can I ask you what what is the source of the discontent I mean if indeed the support for United Russia has dropped really appreciably lately and to some extent though a lesser extent I guess support for Putin himself I mean as you said Putin's support is, is hi higher than United Russia's um, what is the source of the discontent out there in Russia broadly? I mean, I think a number of the people on the street were, were probably democracy activists per se and were motivated by the sheer fact that the elections, in their view, hadn't been fair. But uh, it seems to me if this movement is going to have a large base, it's going to have to draw on people who aren't, aren't just unhappy uh, with the lack of democracy in the abstract, but are unhappy about what the government is delivering to them. Okay, so... It, it, is there much of that? I mean, is the loss of support for United Russia partly based in life getting worse for people, or what? Well, yeah, and I would say there are two major components, because democracy, unfortunately, is not a very high value for most of Russians, unlike like uh, urban uh, pro-democracy cultures that are in St. Petersburg and Moscow. For, for most of Russia, yeah, people, what are really important is the... I would say like two things. So it's uh, uh, standard of living, which has declined after crisis. It was growing till 2008 mm -hmm. for m most of the social groups. And then uh, the inequality had really increased uh, starting, uh, starting in 2008 because uh, the prices got really high. And for example, especially for uh, the big cities, for example, in Russia, it's really hard to not to be a millionaire. Uh, I mean, really, when I come. Well, to well yeah. I mean, it's yes. it's easy not it's easy not to be one. I mean, most people succeed in that sense, but, but it's hard to live in in yeah. uh, Russia if you if you don't have them. It's kind of like living in New York in Manhattan if you're not if you're not rich, uh, you know. But um, okay. Yeah, and the second component is. Uh, unfairness and absolutely no guarantees of any uh, legal or non-legal defenses whatsoever mm -hmm. uh, that were existed because uh, right now the uh, like the let's say well, the ruling class <laughs> whatever it would mean I mean like the, the, there is a number uh, 
like if you have money, and I don't want to sound very Marxist here, it really means that you have, in, in terms of rights and in mm -hmm. terms of your possibilities of dealing with uh, the authorities and the police, it's, it really defines how you deal with them and how, uh, can sure. you be persecuted or can you not be persecuted? Is your mm -hmm. business endangered or not endangered? It all depends on your income. So they, this is really, oh, for example, uh, traffic violations. There are a lot of people that, there are a lot of cases known uh, when, for example, uh, a wife or a daughter of uh, a certain uh, government official hits on a car, like, mm -hmm. and he kills like three people or mm -hmm. two people, and she receive, uh, she, she receives uh, a suspended sentence, mm -hmm. and and this is only because her uh, father or her mother work in the uh, mm -hmm. public uh, administration. So I think that th these number of cases also multiplied by the perceived effect they receive via YouTube videos because, you know, they, these things spread uh, around Russia really fast and especially very uh, loud cases of... Um, and do uh, you see demonstrations organized around specific incidents? In China you have seen some of this. Where, where a particular incident of exactly that kind, a go, an official son getting away with killing someone with a car or something, winds up spurring actual, you know, uh, protest or, or, or a, a local regional in grievance about the environment does or something. Are you seeing any of these uh, kind of incident-specific uh, kind of uh, protest gatherings? Uh, well, gatherings, no, because uh, for a lot of time, like through 2010 and 2011, it was mostly online. So there were like right. blog campaigns dedicated to such events. Uh, there were uh, different, let's say, sometimes they turned out if there was a critical mass, like in uh, April 2000, uh, 2010, which uh, when two women were killed by a car of uh, a Luke Oil, its oil company, uh, top manager that went on the other side of the street, uh, I mean, it was not driving on the lane it was supposed to, and it hit mm -hmm. this car, and those two women, both doctors, uh, died. So it actually was a catalyst for creating a movement so-called Blue Bucket Society, which, among others, was very uh, active in these protests. It's mm -hmm. like because mm -hmm. it okay. was it was actually a movement against uh, traffic violation by uh, by the public officials, uh, and, and and they were part of this weekend's demonstration. Oh, yeah. You're saying yeah, that, they, that, they, that contingent. Okay. Yeah, so this what I, this is a movement what I call uh, internet born because it, you know it, it just get out of the uh, of the reactions spontaneous reactions that later moved mm -hmm. into an internet community an internet community moved to a website the website turned into an offline community and uh, and you know so on and so on and after that uh, uh, they are among those. Uh, 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 those uh, cores that had created the uh, Blotna Square. Hmm. Okay, so so it sounds like uh, y you you do have uh, a, a number of people kind of out there, you know, beyond what you might call, you know, kind of the educated elite who who are unhappy with the way governance is working, and and, and even if it's not so much a pure attachment to democracy per se, it is an unhappiness with, with the failure of government to represent um, people's interests equally in, 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 in particular the judicial system. Um, and then separate from that you have this, this economic grievance which is kind of like the Occupy Wall Street thing. It has to do with economic inequality um, and, and, uh, and so I guess those would be the two potential drivers of this going forward if indeed it is to expand beyond the kind of people who were represented in the demonstrations um, or if, it, if it's if, if it's a really get entrenched and become a, a, a large-scale national thing it sounds like those are those are the two questions is that right yeah yeah I, I actually agree with you um, 
And uh, so that's interesting. Well, uh, this has been this has been very illuminating for me. Um, and uh, it sounds like we should uh, definitely stay tuned. And, and just before we go, tell us what is the next thing we should be focused on? You know, what, what's, what's uh, the, the next event or the next phase where you think, you know, something will either happen or won't happen, and that will be a real indicator of whether the momentum is going to be sustained? Well, I would focus on two things m mainly. The first is release of uh, Alexei Navalny and Ilya Yashin, uh, because it's re right now after they had spent almost two weeks in prison. Mm -hmm. uh, Are they which, protesters? They were they were arrested for being part of this movement, or what? Uh, they were uh, uh, arrested with many many violation in procedure uh, on after of uh, protests mm -hmm. on December 5th mm -hmm. um, and uh, right and before for example Navalny was uh, among those people who were say okay like he's he's a popular blogger but he's not a politician well right now it's different people more and more consider him as a uh, real politician mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so this is the first event and second event will be December 24th and uh, wherever it will have as many participants and it will be as large scale as it was, then we will see wherever the momentum is lost and the uh, and there will be a, and probably uh, uh, the repressions might follow because you know if you have a <laughs> if you have a social graph of all the uh, contacted participants and the FSB potentially can get one, they can actually start uh, repressions against everyone and the conducting network finding out like a lot of interesting information. Mm -hmm. So um, that also might be a scenario. But if the if it really get it the protest will happen with the same force as it was before, or at least a little slow, lower but still powerful, mm -hmm. then we might move into an a interesting uh, situation um, before March. Okay. Well, when something big does happen or, or fails to happen, maybe we'll have you back and you can, uh, again, said, shed some light on it. Um, so okay. thank, thanks a lot for taking the time, Alexi. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.